know, we have the distinct pleasure to have somebody that I consider to be a true visionary in the industry right now. And he's a visionary from experience, not just marketing hype. You know, he started his career in mainframes and he did a lot of programming and debugging of uh, some pretty complicated stuff in the, uh, his days at Burroughs. And he moved out to Silicon Valley and he was right at the crux of both Intel and Microsoft and saw all of the evolution of the client server era as a major thought leader. And now, as the CEO of VMware, I think is an outstanding um, um, spokesman for our industry and bringing outstanding technologies to bear to solve the kind of problems we just talked about. So it's my pleasure to welcome Paul Moritz. Thank you, Steve. It's a great pleasure and a real privilege uh, to be here with you this afternoon. Now, uh, there was a fair amount of talk uh, about this word cloud and the uh, fact that our whole industry has succumbed to cloud fever. And I, I have to be honest and say that uh, we at uh, VMware are not immune either uh, and have been suffering from the same disease. Uh, and it's a uh, as a result, worth actually trying to step a bit backwards and say, is there something behind the hype that is actually uh, worth talking about? And I'm going to try and dig into this word cloud a little bit and try and uh, illustrate some things that I think are worth talking about. Uh, now, now, Steve mentioned that, that I had the, uh, the honor of starting my, my career in the late 70s at a mainframe company. Actually, what happened is I originally from South Africa, and I, I showed up uh, in the middle of winter in London in 19, uh, the beginning of 1978 and knocked on doors, and the first door I knocked on was actually IBM, uh, and they turned me down <laughs> as a job, and as a result, I got a job at, at Burroughs, uh, where uh, short after a few months uh, to, to really punish me, they, they actually had me debug the, the code in the world's first ATM machine, which was a big come down for somebody who was a computer science graduate. Uh, it turned out actually to be a, a, a very fortuitous thing because that put me in a whole different direction in my life. And uh, I went from the mainframe area and got right into the client server area I'll talk about uh, in a second. But the interesting thing about these areas, the mainframe area, the client server, the cloud areas, is I think they are characterized by a set of applications that uh, were really, uh, the, put it this way, the infrastructure of those eras were developed for a certain kind of applications and enabled a certain set of applications. And the key applications in the mainframe area, which still by and large are those that drive mainframes today, are automated bookkeeping applications. This is where core banking uh, is done, et cetera. And underneath those, uh, key applications or canonical applications, there's a canonical data structure. Uh, those of you who were around at this time remember that these applications, by and large, were built on ISAM structures. <laughs> uh, and this is an important point that I'll come back to. Now, I then got uh, involved uh, in the client server area at Intel and Microsoft. And this area is interesting because the first time that we saw the interaction between computing that has been driven out of the enterprise space and computing approaches and architectures that have been driven out of the consumer space. And these two forces started to interact with each other uh, in interesting ways. Uh, so we saw in this uh, generation for the first time IT or computing technologies go outside of uh, the data center into the hands of what became hundreds of millions of users, mainly through the vehicle of, of, of the personal computer, the PC. And we store the emergence of technologies uh, that were driven by that interaction. We saw the graphical user interface, programming approaches like C++, silicon architectures like the Intel architecture. And we saw the emergence of the key data fabric that enabled a new set of canonical applications in this time frame. We saw the emergence of the relational database that enabled applications like the integrated ERP system, CRM, e-commerce, et cetera. I remember Hasso Plattner at SAP telling me that 
uh, the client server error came along just in time to save SAP because he made the decision to build R3 on a relational database. And you could never have got the price performance necessary out of a, uh, a relational database running on a mainframe. That they needed the Unix generation to come along and kind of rescue them just in time. And it was also in this area that we saw the next uh, wave of consumer interaction that came through the web that brought even more users in. We saw technologies uh, like Java and HTML and IP networking infuse into this space. And this is really what our industry has been around, about for the last 20 years, is working through the cycle and generating these canonical applications which are now in broad usage throughout the world. The cloud era, in a similar way, I think can be thought about as the next really major interaction of consumer computing and enterprise computing, but now at a fundamentally different scale. <laughs> Uh, we're going to see not just hundreds of millions of devices interacting and generating information, but billions of devices. And now, not just devices uh, that have humans uh, associated with them and devices that are, have no humans associated with them, sensors, other sorts of things that are now going to be generating large amounts of information. And just as in the client-server era, we're going to see new technologies emerge to deal with the new data fabrics. The canonical applications in this era, I believe, will be high-scale, real-time analytics. In the client-server world, we were still dealing essentially with a non-real-time world. Now, there's some exceptions to this, et cetera. But by and large, we were dealing with a world where the paradigm was to gather information in, put all that information in an orderly way into a relational database, and then a separate cycle run reports over that and flow information out over a period of days or weeks or months. We're moving into a world where that reaction to information is going to have to occur essentially in real time. Uh, we're going to need to be able to gather large amounts of information in and reason about that information and react almost instantaneously. Uh, I was talking recently to uh, some customers uh, from a large supermarket chain, the IT department uh, of a large supermarket, and they were saying that they're having to rethink how they interact with their customers. Their current interaction is basically the customer comes into the shop, uh, they walk around, they fill the shopping cart uh, up, and the first real interaction they have with the customers when they reach the checkout line and start checking things out. They were saying they're going to need to rethink their business where that interaction with that customer has to start before the customer even enters the shop and tracks the activity of the customer while they're in the shop. They want to be able to receive warning from the customer's personal device, whatever that may be, that he's getting close to the shop they want to be able to track that user as he moves through the shop or he or she moves through the shop. If they spend time at a particular place in the shop, they want to know that and be able to react to that. They want to be able to construct an offer that can be made available long before they reach the checkout line and personalize the shopping experience for that customer. Another way of saying this in a rather simplistic and dramatic way we're going to make, finally, the transition from a world of paper bills uh, to a world of real-time interaction. And we're going to have to deal with data sets that are far bigger than anything that we have today. And these applications can't be done on the traditional data fabrics, can't be done on a centralized relational database. And we're going to see and are seeing the emergence of new data fabrics. And when the data fabric changes, that tends to have a huge impact on everything around it, the infrastructure underneath it, uh, the programming tools around it, et cetera. And so this is another perspective of what I see happening in the cloud. And another way of saying what you heard earlier is we as the IT industry need to react to this by taking cost out of what it takes 
to keep the existing canonical applications of the client-server era running, allow people to become operationally much more efficient to keep that legacy running, which they are going to have to keep running for a long time, precisely in, aided, in order to be able to free up the funds to be able to develop the new set of applications and capability, which is where business value will lie going forward. And this is really the challenge for our industry, which is, is how are we going to make this pivot from the client-server world to the cloud world? How are we going to take operational expense out of the complexity we've created and allow our businesses to start putting greater proportion of their budget to the things that are really going to generate business value going forward, which are really going to be about rethinking your interaction with the end customer. So in the light of that, uh, what uh, we've been thinking about is this challenge of how do we achieve, as Steve was saying, going from just capital efficiency to operational efficiency. We have a huge inventory of applications, very important applications that have been built up in the cloud era. Those applications cannot be rewritten overnight and will not be rewritten overnight, which means that we have to work underneath those applications, so as to speak, in order to achieve operational efficiency. We have to get the infrastructure to largely become self-running, automated, fundamentally boring. We have to get the current world that we think of as low-level IT infrastructure, and we have to make that the new hardware. <laughs> Basically, something that's very important, but fundamentally you're not interested in how it's, what's going on internally. You want to plug it in, have it run, and rightfully get very upset if it ever breaks down. <laughs> and at the same, having done that, then focus attention on which I think will be the big story of the next decade, which is application renewal and true innovation to be able to make this pivot from a world of paper bills to ones where you can react in context, in real time, to customer needs. And this will be a Darwinian issue those customers who don't make this transition will not be able to service the Facebook generation in terms of how they want to see and experience information. And at the same time, those end users, those consumers of information, whether it be inside the enterprise or outside the enterprise, are going to be receiving that information on a much more heterogeneous set of devices. Uh, many more device form factors and they're going to want to, expect, want to expect to get a full and satisfying experience, as Steve was saying, on any device, anytime, anywhere. They're going to expect the devices to cleave to them, not they to the devices as they go forward. Uh, so this is the framework that I think all of us in the industry really have to wrap our minds around, uh, and it's going to mean major change. Uh, every time we've gone from one of these eras to the next one, uh, there has been uh, significant uh, readjustment. Uh, these wheels are going to grind slowly, but I'm pretty sure when they've done grinding, they will have ground fine, uh, and there will be both winners and losers uh, in this space. So uh, from a VMware point of view, uh, what we're trying to do is to first and foremost work on this modernization of infrastructure, which is really becomes more and more about operational efficiency. We're trying to make, as I said, infrastructure boring. Uh, the first thing that has to be done, as uh, was pointed out earlier, is we have to decouple the applications from the underlying infrastructure. That's fundamentally what virtualization about, is about. The key thing when you virtualize is what you're doing is you're taking an existing application, wrapping it up into a black box, so as to speak, and that allows you to jack the black box up and slide new functionality in underneath it and ultimately start sliding the black box itself around to get res greater resiliency and efficiency. All right, so we've been working on that. This is now not considered rocket science. Or, or, or if you look at the Gartner hype curve, virtualization I think has made it up all the way up through the hype cycle and down through the valley of despond. And I, I think we're actually now classified as being on a the plateau of productivity or something. I forget what they call it when you come out after the valley of despair. Uh, and what this means actually is, is that uh, 
if you believe uh, the industry numbers, and these are IDC's numbers, is, is that uh, at this point in time, uh, the industry either has crossed over or is about to cross over uh, to the point where uh, more than 50% uh, of the world's uh, total workloads are no longer running on physical infrastructure. Now, I'm not talking about the number of physical servers here. I'm talking about the number of workloads. <laughs> All right, so if you take the number of server applications, at this point in time, there are more server applications running on virtualized infrastructure than there are on physical infrastructure. Those of you who are technically inclined, this has some interesting implications. It means, amongst other things, that there are now more cop copies of a server operating system, be it Windows or Linux, that no longer actually control the hardware than the, those that do. <laughs> All right, so most server applications today are think they're controlling the hardware, but in fact they're just being shown some idealized version of the hardware that this new layer underneath wants them to see. And uh, there's actually some interesting changes that we'll talk about later occurring at the application level uh, as well. The name of the game now, though, uh, is to go beyond that 50% mark. Most companies have achieved that 50% level by going after essentially uh, all of the things that uh, IT doesn't have to ask permission about. <laughs> all right, so IT very quickly goes through, virtualizes all the file and print servers, web servers, their own internal servers. But once you start getting that 50% and beyond mark, you really got to start asking permission because you've got to go after line of business applications. And unfortunately, because of the way IT is governed in a lot of organizations, it's kind of a tax across all the top of the business units. Uh, no individual business unit has an incentive to become more efficient. They'd rather you go and make someone else's application more efficient, thank you. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, but now we really have to go after those applications and customers are gearing up to do this. Uh, we track this pretty uh, uh, carefully. Uh, this is, uh, we have technical account managers in our largest accounts who uh, get access to this information. So we. This is fairly good data in the larger accounts. Uh, and what you're seeing now is customers really coming to grips and starting to virtualize uh, their core line of business applications precisely so they can get to that standardized, more agile underlying infrastructure that several speakers have spoken about today. <laughs> the step beyond that, though, is to really get to operational efficiency. How can we make the infrastructure transparent, not just from a, a technology point of view, but from an operational point of view. How can we make this truly capacity on demand, self-healing, managed by policy, not by humans? And that's the journey that uh, the industry and, 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 our, and VMware in particular is setting out at this point in time. At this point in time, it's not sufficient simply to have core virtualization. Uh, uh, a basic hypervisor is not enough. Uh, you have to look at a much broader set of things that have to come together to give you true infrastructure on demand. And uh, that's what we are now working on as a company, which is building out a full suite of the functions that we think you need to have to get a private cloud or a public cloud from an infrastructure perspective. And you have to address the basic pooling capabilities, because what you're essentially doing is creating a bigger pool of compute storage and networking out of which many applications can eat. So you need that core pooling capability. You need the capabilities to uh, uh, set it up for redundancy reasons, because you want to be able to do that across data centers. You need the capability to plug into the broad set of security functions, because now uh, most applications in the world aren't islands to themselves. They have a set of functions that protect the application. It could be a firewall, a data loss prevention engine, an antivirus engine, a load balancer, etc. If those functions are held in physical devices, you're not going to get the application portability that you need to be able to slide applications around for efficiency and resiliency reasons. So those physical functions have to come out and themselves be virtualized, and they need a framework that they can plug into. 
That's what we call our V-Shield framework. We're working with all the usual suspects in the industry to do that. And then you need a user interface to expose that so customers can easily self-provision from infrastructure. And lastly, you need a set of tools for the custodian of that pool of infrastructure. One of the interesting things that happens when you go to this approach is there's a strong line now drawn between infrastructure and applications. You're going to have a big pool of infrastructure that many applications eat out of. You can no longer manage on a per silo basis. That custodian of the big pool of the infrastructure in many cases is not going to even know what really is in that application that is being run. They need a way of being able to ascertain the fundamental health of that pool of infrastructure in an application independent way. Uh, and what's more is that pool gets bigger, the amount of information, if you turned on all of the logging capabilities the pool could give you, would overwhelm any human. <laughs> uh, so we have to move to fundamentally different ways of analyzing what's going on down here. And this is actually management in this uh, cloud infrastructure world really becomes actually an interesting instance of one of these new scale-out real-time analytics problems. Uh, you need basically an engine that's sitting there ingesting all of the status information from that pool of infrastructure and is reasoning over it in real time and saying, is this infrastructure healthy according to what we've statistically seen before or not? And that's uh, what we have been building uh, into this uh, layer that we call vCenter operations. Uh, but fundamentally, we believe that customers want this problem just to go away. They want to be able to load applications, specify uh, the policies that they want those applications to, to run, and then they want this pool of infrastructure to take over and run it. This, in some senses, is going back to the mainframe world <laughs> in that sense, with a difference that I'll come back to. Uh, whether mainframes were, in fact, ever really like this or not uh, is, is another thing, but we won't, uh, we won't go into that. Uh, but we want to go back to this new modern mainframe that you just load applications into and have them run. Now, the other interesting challenge is, is if you make infrastructure become essentially utility, uh, the question becomes then, how do you want to buy it? Do you want to buy it by the drink? Do you want it prov pr pr provided on premise? Do you want it to run in somebody else's data center? And the answer is, if it's done properly, you shouldn't ultimately really care a lot about that. Those should become business decisions rather than technology decisions. Your application should be indifferent to that. All right, so we're trying to, again, work towards that ideal uh, by saying that customers can choose either a private cloud or a public cloud, and they can move applications as makes business sense backwards and forwards between them. Uh, we're engaged in a partnership uh, with companies to do this. Uh, interestingly, we're starting to see the first vertical clouds emerging, uh, people building clouds that are targeted at specific industries. Uh, New York Stock Exchange is going to build one targeted at their customers. Harris is building one uh, targeted at the healthcare world. Uh, but amongst uh, our set of partners, we've chosen to work very closely with a smaller set who are committed to really deliver this vision. And I'm very happy to say uh, that amongst that small set of partners that we're working with is Dell. And uh, we're working to make this uh, essentially a business decision for customers, whether you want to realize cloud computing internally or externally. We believe that cloud computing is more about how than where. Finally, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, the other challenges, those of renewing and modernizing applications and how we project the results of those applications to end users. Uh, go through this fairly quickly at a high level, but I think it is critically important. Uh, the story over the next 10 years is going to be to come back to the things that really encode business value, and that means coming back to applications. Uh, we have been trying to think ahead and say, what is the next generation of programmers likely to do? So we've been paying a lot of attention to what people under the age of 35 are doing, unlike people uh, myself who are safely on the far, far side of 35. Uh, and uh, there has really recently been a revolution in how developers approach the world. There's been 
uh, one of those periodic developer-led uh, reactions against complexity where they've taken things into their own hands and said a pox upon all of you. Uh, and they have come up with these new modern programming frameworks, whether they be, and there are, the interesting thing is there are a lot of ferment there, there are many of them. Ruby on Rails, Spring, Node.js, Scala World, et cetera. This is what the next generation of programmers will use. So any strategy here has to start with that as one of its considerations. Uh, and we are investing heavily in uh, this world of modern programming frameworks. Then you have to say, how do we augment, and, it, and notice I say augment, not replace, because there will still be many applications that can be done with a classical relational database system, but with new data fabrics. And uh, we see really a, a two by two matrix emerging uh, where you see a world of SQL and NoSQL, different access approaches, scale up, scale out. And each of those four boxes will need a solution uh, as we go through it. So we've started to uh, invest in that technology, uh, the particular technology that we've invested in to gain some experience there is a technology called Gemfire, uh, which uh, addresses the scale out world, both SQL and NoSQL. Uh, interesting uh, set of technologies used by some of the most demanding applications in the world. The US Department of Defense uses Gemfire to track all of their real time assets. So every single vehicle in the US that has telemetry on it today, which is a large number, is constantly reporting its status into the system. This system gets 60,000 updates a second. Uh, Visa gets 20,000 a second. <laughs> to give you some idea of the scale at which this is operating at. <laughs> but interestingly, that comes this question of how do we really divorce applications from the underlying infrastructure? There's a fair amount of debate in the industry today. Is are we going through a fundamental era of re-verticalization? Uh, are we going back to the mainframe era, not just in terms of having a great you know, system that kind of runs automatically and never stops, but are we going to go back to a world where programmers have to choose one of those stacks and be bound to that stack forever and a day? And there are certainly players in this industry who strongly espouse that point of view, and it's a reasonable point of view. Uh, Oracle clearly wants you to basically enter the Oracle universe and stay there forever. <laughs> and you have to buy their entire solution to do that. Uh, to a lesser degree, Microsoft's arguing the same thing with Azure. If you buy into the .NET programming world, you're basically choosing Azure as your deployment cloud going forward. We don't think that that is a good thing for the happen in the industry, and what's more, we think that ultimately the development community and the open source community won't allow that to happen. Uh, if infrastructure level clouds are becoming the new hardware, the question is, will there emerge a new cloaking layer? The Linux for the cloud era, if you like that will cloak infrastructure level clouds and give you a greater rather than a lesser degree of portability across the new hardware. Uh, we happen to believe that. Uh, two and a half years ago, we hired uh, a couple of gentlemen who had uh, very experienced developers who'd worked on Google's Borg engine. Those of you who know about Google, they have this thing internally called Google called the Borg. Uh, which is what they deploy their applications onto. And now it's highly specialized for their environment, uh, but it certainly knows how to scale. And uh, these two gentlemen had worked on that, and we hired them and put them to work on developing this new layer, this new Linux for the cloud era. Uh, they have now brought that uh, to fruition uh, in a, technology, a set of technologies that we call Cloud Foundry. And given that we believe that there would have to be an open source reaction to this. We made the decision to release this technology uh, in open source form. So the core technologies, in fact, have been released uh, under Apache 2 license. Uh, and we've stood it up now in a test situation for developers uh, to get access to. The interesting thing about this technology, it's designed on the one hand to take applications written in these new programming frameworks and map them onto different underlying clouds. So you can write an application and deploy it at scale uh, on 
a VMware provided cloud or on Amazon or on Rackspace or on OpenStack, et cetera. And in fact, the open source industry is already kicking into it and starting to do this. And interesting, they're starting to extend it to other programming frameworks. We did the work behind Spring, the Ruby family uh, node. The community has now done Scalar and they're working on, on, on other ones as well. This is what we think the world is going to, which is highly automated infrastructure at the lower level infrastructure level. We're moving to the new hardware, if you like, and there's going to be a new operating system sitting on top of that that will provide a greater rather than a lesser degree uh, of application portability. In that sense, we don't think we're going back to you know, the California motels uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, in the cloud era. I, I, I did know that it was rather rich of uh, Larry Ellison to accuse salesforce.com of being closed and proprietary. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I wanted to touch on this issue uh, of uh, how we project to the end users. And the challenge here is obviously, how do we take the assets that are important to the enterprise? And the assets that are important to the enterprise at the end of the day are applications and data. <laughs> That's what they want to sustain and protect and control. And they want to be able to securely project those assets onto whatever device a user happens to pick up during that point of the day. This means that the nature of the desktop to some degree is going to have to transform. Traditionally, the way that you, enterprises have controlled uh, the capabilities that a user get access to, the applications and the data has been by customizing the Windows desktop. Uh, that's where you install applications, turn menus on and off, drop files, etc. In a multi-device world, that aspect of the desktop is going to have to get abstracted away from any particular operating system or device. So our industry is now on a journey to find that metaphor. All of us are kind of trying to grope around and figure out what this new metaphor is. Uh, and we are working on that as well uh, around a set of technologies that we call the Horizon Application Manager, which is designed to provide a capability to allow you to associate applications and data to an individual rather than a device, and then appropriately project those capabilities out to the device. Uh, Vivek, uh, uh, in closing, I'll just describe one. And I think you're going to have to master several different ways of doing that. Uh, because to give the user an appropriate experience, how you map capabilities to a full featured Windows desktop, and how you map capabilities uh, uh, to an Apple iPad is going to be quite different. <laughs> uh, what's acceptable on one is not going to be acceptable on the other. Again, a lot of experimentation by the industry here. The one that Vivek mentioned is that we're experimenting with is we're going into trials with a large carrier here in the US uh, and a large carrier in Europe around the concept of a virtual phone. So rather than enterprises buying a physical phone for their user, they'll buy a virtual phone for their user. Uh, and then that virtual phone will jump down and live on the user's physical phone that he or she is personally bought. <laughs> uh, so it's li literally like two phones in one. So Basically, you'll have the ability to have your personal phone and your work phone. In Europe, you'll, because they've programmed their networks that way, you'll even be able to have your two different phone numbers associated with the phone. But the big advantage of this is, is that the enterprise can control and wall off the applications that their users see. They don't have to worry that if a user downloads a hacked version uh, of Angry Birds, <laughs> It's going to read the corporate address book and transmit it to Turkmenistan. They can, in the work phone, control what gets installed there. They can have their own app store, so as to speak, that goes into uh, that environment. Now, we're going to find out whether users like that. You know, do they happy to live with two phones in one, or do they find it too schizophrenic? The answer is I don't know, uh, but we're going to go find out. And this is, I think, indicative of the different approaches that are going to have to be tried in this space. So. With that, I uh, wanted to close by saying that we have a long-standing partnership with Dell. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with Dell, uh, and uh, there's tremendous opportunity for us to do great things in the future, whether it be uh, in the coordination of 
compute and storage and networking uh, in this new world of a multi-device world. Uh, and in particular, as Dell expands into services, I think there's tremendous opportunity for us to work together. And uh, I'm here in part today to uh, express our thanks for that partnership and express uh, our desire to continue it long into the future. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.